Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, uh, from Recommended Channel, um, on the Discord. So, there might be some more construction noises than usual, but, uh, something I have to deal with. I think I adjusted the audio so that it won't, uh, be too loud. My name is Connor. Hi. I like to learn and watch YouTube and stuff. Mark Felton Productions, amazing channel. He's very professional. I've even seen him on a few, like, uh, history documentaries on TV. Uh, he was in one about the uh, war in the Pacific in World War II, and it was fascinating. He, he seems to know a lot about, uh, you know, the Japanese over there uh, in World War II. So, Japanese soldier found in Ukraine. World War II Japanese soldier found in Ukraine? Let's watch. And learn. In 2006, the Japanese embassy in Kyiv, Ukraine, received a strange and unlikely request for assistance. An old man contacted the embassy, and he had an extraordinary story. The 83-year-old was Japanese, and had lived in Ukraine since 1965. He told embassy officials that he was a veteran of the Imperial Japanese Army, and previously a prisoner of the Red Army, and he wished to make himself known to his country and his family, whom he had not seen in decades. The man's name was Ishinosuke Uano, and it had been so many decades since he had spoken Japanese that he struggled with the language of his birth. The story made waves in Japan and around the world. For decades after the end of World War II, Japanese soldiers had been emerging from jungle hideouts to surrender, many believing that the war had never... I heard about that in the sev like some held out to the 70s. I mean, how fanatical do you have to... they were very... ...never ended. The last really famous case had been that of 2nd Lieutenant Hiro Onoda, who had reluctantly surrendered on the Philippine island of Lubang in 1974, after holding up for an astounding 29 years. Damn. Jesus. Um, I heard, like, they dropped leaflets, and I can understand, okay, that could be the enemy, whatever. But then they had, like, the, his general, like, their, their generals, like, over loudspeaker or over radio saying, like, no, the war is over. And for 30 more years, that shows you how, like, the, the ja they were so fanatical that, like, not, they weren't even fanatical, like, for their general or, or anything. It was just, like, it, it was, a, like, a religious fanaticism that there was just no way they could ever surrender, even if, even if, like, everyone died on their home country. And that, that's crazy. It is. One other, a Formosan soldier serving in the Japanese army, Private Teruo Nakamura, had surrendered on Moritai Island in Indonesia a few months after Onoda. Since 1974, no more documented Japanese holdouts have been discovered, though it was suspected that several did exist but were never found before they died. The news that 31 years after Onoda and Nakamura had been found, another missing Japanese soldier had turned up caused a sensation. But unlike Onoda and the other holdouts, the experience of Private Oano was completely different. He was no die-hard holdout, rather one of thousands of Japanese who had ended up a prisoner of Stalin. The island of Sakhalin was, in World War II, divided since the conclusion of the 1905 Russo-Japanese War between the two nations. During World War II, the Japanese were always wary of Soviet intentions, for although the USSR was an ally of Britain and America in the war in Europe, in Asia the Soviet Union was neutral and had an agreement with Japan to this effect. Since Japanese defeat at the hands of the Red Army in a short-lived military campaign in 1939 in Mongolia, the Imperial Japanese Army stationed a large force of troops in northern China, Korea and southern Sakhalin to deter a Soviet invasion. An invasion that could have led to a backdoor invasion of the Japanese home islands themselves. Unbeknown to Japan, in the summer of 1945, fresh from the defeat of Nazi Germany, Stalin had secretly agreed to declare war on Japan. 
On the 9th of August, 1945, with Japan on its last legs and facing an Allied invasion of the south of the country, the Red Army smashed through the depleted Japanese forces in northern China and Korea, simultaneously terrifying the Japanese government, the invasion being one of the major factors in Japan's surrendering on the 15th of August, to avoid the Soviet troops gaining a foothold in Japan itself. On Sakhalin, the Soviets met strong Japanese resistance, resistance that actually continued after the main Japanese... Guys, do you think then that there's a possibility that Japan could have ended up like Korea in that if, like, the Soviets and Americans invaded rather than the atomic bomb uh, being used and America essentially defeating them and, and taking over the country alone, that there could have been a sort of, like, northern communist Japan versus... Uh, southern capitalist Japan. Surrender, the final Japanese units giving up on the 25th of August 1945, 10 days after Hirohito had announced the surrender. Huge numbers of Japanese soldiers became prisoners of war. Overall, at war's end, the Soviets captured between 560 and 760,000 Japanese troops. Japanese POWs would eventually be sent to over 70 labor camps across the Soviet Far East, including Siberia, and between 60,000 and 347,000 would die under conditions not dissimilar to those the Japanese had dished out to Allied POWs across Asia, and similar to the treatment German prisoners received in Soviet hands. Ooh. Private Oano was one of those Japanese POWs captured on Sakhalin, and one of thousands who were kept on the island long after the war to labor for their new masters. The majority of Japanese POWs, who were still alive in 1956, were released and allowed to return home to Japan. Many, however, were retained for labor and not allowed to go home, though as the years passed they gained more freedoms under the Soviet system and became in effect Soviet citizens. Iwano was permitted to move from Sakhalin to Zitomir, Ukraine in 1965. He got a job, married a Ukrainian woman, and had three children, two girls and a boy. The last time his family had heard from him was in 1958, and he was declared legally dead by the Japanese government in 2000. So it was, six years later, that Private Owano, now an 83-year-old retired pensioner, suddenly made his existence known to the Japanese authorities. The excuse he gave for his silence was that such contact had been forbidden during the Soviet era, which was quite true. Iwano's story caused Russia to investigate how many former Japanese POWs were still in the former Soviet Union in 2006. They arrived at a figure of around 400 men, with at least 40 having been positively identified. Most would have been legally dead in Japan by this time. The Japanese authorities arranged for Iwano to visit Japan for the first time since 1943. Accompanied by his son, Iwano had an emotional reunion with his brother and two sisters, and many other members of his family. Ten days later, he returned to Ukraine. Uh, that's the hammering, guys. I, there's not much I can do about it. It's right above me. Where he died in 2013 at the age of 90 or 91. Interestingly, a link exists with the present... 90 days later, he returned to Ukraine, where he died in 2013 at the age of 90 or 91. Interestingly, a link exists with the present conflict in Ukraine. Two of Oano's grandchildren, twins aged seven, were recently evacuated from Ukraine due to the Russian invasion. They were sent to Japan, causing another flurry of interest in their late grandfather's interesting life story. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Awesome. One of my favorite channels. He's amazing. That could be cool, too. Um, yeah. Hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, did I have any questions? If I did, if you could answer those or leave recommendations or whatever in the comments, leave a comment. See what happens. See you guys next time. Bye.